This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet, UFO Weekly News, Eric Hervin, and Nick Martin. I thank you all so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? I'm happy to welcome back this week Mr. Lyle Blackburn. Hey, Lyle. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's been a couple of years since you've been on since the Lizard Man book. Yeah, yeah, there's been a, a few adventures since we last talk, talked. Yeah. And and you've been involved in some movie projects, too. Right, yeah, that's that's kind of uh, slipped in there, you know, between the books, which has, you know, been a lot of fun. Okay, well, the newest book is Momo. The Strange Case of the Missouri Monster. And uh, so far, this might be my favorite book of yours, just because it has some of the paranormal elements in it. Right. Yeah, I've got some really good feedback on it. And, you know, I think it, it you know, while all my books have been good, it's, it's up to this point where I've really honed in on, you know, the way to investigate and present these cases in in the narrative so you know i've I, I fine-tuned it and i think momo yeah is definitely just you know one of the best i've done it's uh it's very well written i mean all your stuff is well written but I, I it almost gives me the feel of being there in some cases the way you're describing stuff especially when you were going down looking at some of these sites right that that's one of my favorite things to you know, to write about is just my experience being there and then trying to bring the reader there because, you know, you, you, you see, you know, you read these accounts that are sort of disconnected from any certain culture in which they're, um, they're happening. So it's, I think it's important in these cases to try to, you know, talk about the place, the people and everything else that's involved to kind of give the, the bigger perspective on just what was going on during these you know, weird cases. So, for people who aren't familiar with you, do you want to tell people how you got into cryptozoology in the first place? Well, it was it was something that chose me, I suppose. Uh, you know, just as a kid, I, I always gravitated towards movie monsters and, you know, creepy things and so forth. And then when I was pretty young, I saw... Uh, the show In Search Of, which was an old show with Leonard Nimoy as the host, and they mm -hmm. talked about, you know, Bigfoot and swamp monsters and witches and all sorts of stuff. And I really love that because, to me, it was almost scarier because, you know, movie monsters were, you know, made of latex and an actor, but these things could actually exist. And so it's just something that I, I always loved. And I read books and watched TV shows. And then as an adult, I became a writer and a musician. And uh, somehow or another, the writing, I ended up writing for the horror magazine Rue Morgue and then got the idea, well, I, could, I really want to write a book. And I thought, well, what would I write a book on? And I thought, man, I remember seeing this old movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek, about a <laughs> Uh, Bigfoot like creature in southern Ar Arkansas, not far from where I live in Texas. And so I set out to, to write that book almost just because I wanted to know the truth behind uh, the movie and the sightings of the creatures. And that, you know, I got a, a publishing deal with Anomalist, and the book came out and it was very well received. And television started calling me, uh, wanting to comment on the case on, on their shows. And and it just went from there. I thought, well, okay, this is great. I'd love to investigate these type of things. And I, I just continued. Nice. And uh, the, mentioning music, you're also in Ghoul Town. You there? Oh. Right. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've spent, uh, you know, most since high school, really, in, in various recording bands and touring around the world. And uh, I've since created a band called ghoul town which is what i was doing 
prior to the time when I started writing the, the cryptid books and uh, I, I still have the band and we, I still uh, record albums. So that's kind of a, a juggling thing there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for Momo, uh, this, this is from Louisiana, Missouri, which is just very confusing to say. Oh man, he's try writing it out of a book where, <laughs> where the name of the town is Louisiana, but it's not Louisiana. So yeah, that was tricky, but you know, entertaining. <laughs> so this this started the the main cases for Momo started in the early seventies, right? Right. Yeah. It it, it really became uh, you know got media attention in in July of nineteen seventy two when. Um, in this little town of Louisiana, Missouri, which is all the way on the east uh, border there where the Mississippi River separates Missouri from Illinois. And uh, it's just a little, uh, you know, kind of a town where there's woods and uh, rolling hills and farms and very scenically beautiful. And uh, these kids were playing in their backyard one day, which is at the foot of this uh, hill called Marzoff Hill. And these two boys looked up and saw this some kind of a hair covered creature standing there it stood on two legs uh it had, it had hair that hung down over its face and obscured you know its eyes and it appeared to be holding what they thought was a dead dog and of course they were you know f extremely frightened and took off running for the house and their older sister doris who was uh doris harrison who was 15 at the time looked out the window and saw the thing as well and you know, her brothers came in the house, and they they called their mother, who called their dad, and the dad came home, and you know, by then whatever it was had fled back onto Mars off Hill. But um, that uh, basically set off a wave of bizarre things that took place in this little town, and uh, their father Edgar Harrison spent a lot of time in the next month or two, uh, almost trying to you know prove what his kids had seen because you know he didn't doubt what they had seen he just wanted to you know vindicate them to those that may have scoffed and all of that got a lot of media attention first in the local newspapers and then basically in the associated press and was syndicated to newspapers all around so it was a really hot topic there in the summer of 72 and do you think if this happened now, it would see the, the same seriousness being taken in all those newspapers? Or do you think they would just ignore it? No, I definitely don't think it, it would happen now. And, mm -hmm. and that's some of the beauty of these cases is like you can only imagine just what was going on. I mean, it literally it was like scenes out of a movie with 40 people running up the street when they saw these strange lights in the sky screaming, you know, they're here. And uh, the sheriff organizing a hunt and they took 20 men up onto Mars off Hill with guns looking for the creature and uh, all kinds of strange things like that. But nowadays, you know, it would almost be like, you know, a, a, it would be on the newspapers, you know, blog site, it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek, somebody saw a Bigfoot thing, and, you know, that would be about it. But mm -hmm. this this literally, you know, was followed up with numerous articles, you know, almost daily coming out of there. And I just don't think that, you know, people would follow it like that. You know, now it would be eclipsed in several days by some, you know, political nonsense or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Where where did the name Momo come from? Uh, it was a name that the newspapers gave the creature. It's short for the abbreviation for Missouri, which is M-O, and then Monster, so Momo, mm -hmm. Missouri, Missouri Monster. And that, that was the, uh, the newspapers that gave it the name. It, it doesn't sound particularly frightening as Momo. Right, it, it doesn't. It just sort of sounds kind of cuddly, you know. It's, oh, it's a big, hairy... <laughs> cuddly beast but but in in reality if you read these encounters it certainly was quite the contrary i mean it was frightening and uh some of some of them were well you know it didn't wasn't so aggressive to chase people but um later on it had been discovered that a year earlier two women had been traveling south uh 
towards St. Louis, and they stopped at this scenic turnout uh, just on the north side of the little town of Louisiana to have a picnic, you know, in, in daylight. And they were out there, and they smelled this really awful smell and looked up to see this hairy thing standing at the edge of the trees. And, of course, they they just panicked when it kind of stepped out and they ran and got in their car and the thing walked up and approached them and their keys were still laying over there on their on the picnic table or wherever and uh, this thing you know just came up and looked in the window at them and I mean they were just you know uh, you know beside themselves and they finally honked the horn which caused the thing to kind of jump back and eventually uh, dart back into the woods um, but, you know, it's super frightening um, if you were those women. And obviously, to me, that provides some credibility to the whole thing because, you know, it, it wasn't something they made up. They reported this to the state police. And also, uh, you know, I have a hard time believing it was somebody in a costume if they saw this in daylight standing outside their car window. I mean, it would be quite easy to tell if it was some hokey costume by some kids or in what they described as, as some kind of a, you know, hairy ape like creature. So mm -hmm. that, uh, that's the reality of the Momo. Now, now you spend uh, about a chapter, I think talking about some of the earlier cases in the same area, but those, those cases didn't ignite this, this sort of uh, fervor over it. No. Yeah. It was really just when the Harrison kids saw it and that happened to get in the news. And usually in these cryptid cases, that's the thing. You, you always have something that somehow uh, is dramatic enough and gets some news coverage. And at that point, when people in the area start reading it or you do research, you know, the general area, all of a sudden you find that there's there's been reports that existed previously, but that just no one had you know, reported them to the paper or, or, you know, the papers or journalists didn't get wind of it. So just like in those kind of cases with Momo, you start kind of looking up and down that Missouri area into Illinois and, uh, you know, up into Iowa and things. And all of a sudden you, you notice that, wow, there's reports of, you know, wild men or, you know, ape like creatures that had gone on, you know, 50 or a hundred years prior. Now, Describe a little of how Momo behaved and some of the stuff that was associated with him. Well, the description of the thing, like I said, was just kind of a ubiquitous, kind of a Bigfoot, you know, description. Maybe stood as tall as a man, you know, maybe six foot, not not overly huge, but uh, much shaggier. And, of course, the hair hung over its eyes. And they said it had a pumpkin-sized head. So for whatever reason, its head was larger than what one would expect uh, anatom you know, in the anatomy of an ape, I guess, or something. Um, and, you know, it was often seen, uh, you know, just in – glimpses as many bigfoot type things are where it's running across a road or it steps out of the woods um never never particularly you know tried to chase anybody down but uh was said to have a very strong odor kind of a skunk ape kind of a thing and uh it would uh, what people thought it was digging up dead dogs on Mars off Hill. You know, the kid, the Harrison kids said they saw it carrying a dead dog. So it was kind of associated with dead animals. Um, and the, you know, the behavior of it was just, you know, odd, strange. And, and, and that was kind of associated with other strange phenomenon that was reported or seen at the same time, which included, uh, strange lights in the sky, UFO activity, and even disembodied voices that were heard in the woods as people were searching, you know, the Mars off air hill area. And so you kind of had a, a, a more of a, a paranormal presence, I guess, if you will, not just sort of straight cryptozoology Bigfoot sightings. You also had that other dimension of, of UFO sightings and stuff, which actually drew in uh, the investigators from MUFON, who were some of the primary, you know, investigators that documented the case, which was fortunate because there wasn't a lot of Bigfoot researchers back then. So luckily, these UFO researchers who believed there was a, some sort of a connection between the creature and the skyward activity 
came in and documented some of these sightings. Now, now I know, and I've talked to you before about this. You said, is this like the first case you found that has that you've researched that has the paranormal activity as well as the sightings? Because I know in the past you said you'd never really come across that yourself. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, definitely has you know a, a significant more amount. I mean, it, in getting Bigfoot reports over the years from you know many many people. I've only had a couple of times where somebody mentions anything about, you know, a UFO or strange lights in the sky, uh, you know, sort of extraterrestrial element. Most of the time, it's just simply, I saw this big old hairy thing walking in the woods with Momo. Uh, it, you know, it definitely did have a, have a, this element of, you know, whether the, whether the phenomenon in the sky was connected or whether it was coincidental it was definitely going on and it's not unlike some of the cases documented in in that general area some being over in uh, pennsylvania and the chestnut ridge and mm -hmm. investigators like stan gordon have written about those where they would get you know and also back in the 70s they get this influx of ufo reports and also people saying they saw these big hairy creatures in the woods so there are cases where, where you have simultaneous phenomenon going on but me personally especially having researched a lot of stuff down here in the south i don't get a lot of ufo correlations with you know ape like creatures do you think some of that might be because people associate them differently like they'll see lights but they won't think too much about it but then they'll see the monster and they don't associate afterward well, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, and I notice in these cases, you know, people just become more vigilant and notice things more that they may not have noticed before or may not have reported. So, you know, once, you know, once somebody's reported, you know, quote unquote, a monster in the woods, people, you know, are starting to look around and, you know, if, if they do see something like, you know, a UFO or something, then then that suddenly becomes something to report as well, you know, because who knows, you know, it could be connected or whatever. And um, So, yeah, I think in these cases, people start noticing phenomenon and then all whatever's going on ends up getting reported. Um, now, no one actually saw UFOs, though. They saw lights, right? They just no one saw like a craft or anything like that. Just weird lights floating around. Yeah, mostly. They, it was, for the most part, it was strange colored lights that were moving, you know, in downward trajectories or in some cases kind of hovering above a bluff. Um, there's some bluffs that are there on the Mississippi River by the town. And, it's, you know, one of the descriptions kind of talked about it as if it was some kind of a craft, but it was mostly just lights. I mean, they yeah. didn't say they saw... You know, there was no landing gear or or silvery disc, none of that. So it was mostly the lights. And and it kind of it, it almost seems to have a touch of the the Mothman prophecy type of stuff with lights and monsters and everything else showing up, and some of the high strangeness stuff you report on there, like the voices. There's uh there's two you quote on here. One said, uh, "You boys stay out of these woods." It was just like a normal voice, right? Yeah, I assume, you know, it sounded like a, a person to them. And then when they would investigate, they couldn't find any source for it, no person in these woods. So, you know, the voice wasn't necessarily, you know, otherworldly or ominous, I don't know. But, but yeah, just, just kind of weird stuff that, again, you know, somebody may, that, may have heard that, but without the monster reports, it would have never been on record, you know. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't even have thought twice about it. It would have just been a weird story that happened to them, but they wouldn't have reported it. Right. Uh, was there another one, too? There was another one. I didn't write it down. Uh, yeah, there was another one where they were, uh, they camped out a lot at the Harrison's property. That sort of became Monster Central headquarters there. And I think when they were sitting out there once, it said something about. Uh, their cup of coffee or something it was something about oh, co right. yeah. coffee. I can't, I can't think of the quote offhand, but it was, yeah, just like, you it, know, it said something like, I, I would like a cup of that coffee or something like that. Right. 
so Some, something just, very weird that just doesn't fit right it's just so weird and it doesn't even uh, it, you know it just puts another piece of a puzzle that doesn't quite fit together so all in all it just built like you say kind of a mothman thing we have multiple weird things going on and no almost just makes it even more more difficult to solve any of it yeah um now monster hunters so we talked about the first case there were a couple other cases after that and then like the monster hunters just descended on this place yeah, that, and that's another thing that I, I don't I don't think would happen in today's world. It's as these newspaper reports went out, then you know people would read these and drive from miles and miles away and come down there with the intent of, of you know I'm gonna go up in the woods and I'll find this monster, and they would come down there with a six pack and a shotgun and literally start heading up to Mars off hill, and you know in this you know chaos going on i mean the the chief of police you know was trying his best to keep people from getting shot and there was a case where a one of the somebody owned a bull and it was actually shot because you know i guess it was mistaken for the creature or whatever some trigger happy uh monster hunter shot it and so this was the main concern almost for the police was just hoping that people didn't get shot because they're looking for the monster but you know you, you saw that same thing in in the boggy creek case where people were just coming up there running amok in the woods and you know i think nowadays pe you wouldn't attract so many hunters and if it did the, the police would probably shut it down pretty fast but yeah and, and they of course never found any no not really i mean that the searches that were even the searches that were organized by the uh, game warden and the chief of police where they went up and very thoroughly combed mars off hill they you know didn't come up with any evidence of the creature um you know they found some weird stuff there was a shack up there that appeared to uh, where you know perhaps something had been bedding down in there it had a weird odor and uh, stuff like that and you know tracks had been faint tracks had been found here and there but when they were doing their searches law enforcement themselves they didn't find anything and you know that's I, I don't know if that's indicative of there was nothing to find because I've been up on Mars off hill and I mean it is thick and wooded and I mean you know anim, any kind of an animal or something wanting to hide probably wouldn't have too hard of a time to conceal itself because it's literally uh, you know, you're looking for something in, in these thick, thick woods over this big mountain. Well, it's not a mountain, but a, a huge hill that connects to other woods that goes on with, you know, uh, fields of corn and everything else. Just tons of places to hide. Yeah. you. Uh, one of the things you talk about it here is the difference between, like, the northern Bigfoots and the southern Bigfoots. They, they have distinct characteristics for certain areas don't they yeah i mean you do see you know some distinctive traits between the two areas i mean in some in some regard it's kind of a ubiquitous type description i mean it walks on two legs it's got brownish dark hair and it you know it's uh, things like that but then um, there are particulars like the smell you you get a lot more reports of the creatures in the south or you know from missouri on south as having this skunky horrible odor um they always tend to be hairier as well i mean like the whole thing with momo having the hair in its face um or being more scraggly and as opposed to sort of the the bigfoot descriptions from the pacific northwest or maybe even ohio where they just seem more of this sort of um, you know, powerful big ape with a, uh, rather than these sort of rogue kind of creatures. So, you know, you, you do see that and it's not really as it's hard to say if that's just, uh, you know, something that has resulted from the environment. Like if these things do ex exist, I mean, obviously something that exists in a hotter, uh, environment may, you know, may exhibit the smell, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, 
things like that. And certainly the size has also been one thing, you know, you, you typically get uh, reports that these creatures in this, the more South you go, they're, they're almost like in the five foot, six or seven foot zone uh, many times. And you don't get these like eight or nine foot tall monstrosities that you get in the mountain mountain areas. Hmm. Um. The what was what was I going to ask? Oh, there, there was one case where uh, someone did get chased by this thing. Um, was that he, saw, he, he, he thought he saw a farmer standing in the field, and then they, it kept coming toward him, and he ended up jumping into someone's dog pen and pounding on the the farmhouse door, and they wouldn't let him in. Oh yeah, 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 that guy. Uh, yeah, that was a quite a story, and and the, this was one that was reported many years later um, that wasn't necessarily in the original newspaper accounts. Um, and uh, I believe that happened in 1974. So it was a couple of years after, um, you know, what had, what had taken place in the main part of it. And in that case, yeah, he, he and a buddy had gone out looking for some party out there in the sticks and, uh, he kind of got separated and decided to walk back and he was walking along this road and he could hear something over there in the brush and he thought it was, you know, first it was some cows and then he thought it was a farmer or just something and, but it was kind of keeping pace with him and eventually he, uh, he saw it and it looked like, you know, a, some sort of a hairy creature of some sort and then he he found a farmhouse and kind of bolted for that and tried to knock on the door and the people wouldn't wouldn't open it. And uh, the creature, you know, came up and eventually backed off because there was a bunch of barking dogs. But those are the exciting ones where, you know, I mean, there's no way to prove or disprove it, but yeah. certainly adds to the excitement of the of what was going on at the time. And it seems to be one of the few that, that Momo was aggressive in any way. Right, yeah. There was very few where where it did anything like that like stalking anybody because like i said usually it was you know it was moving a, off in another direction or if it saw a light you know a, a guy down by the river saw it one night and flashed his flashlight on it and it just sort of bolted you know for the trees so mm -hmm. typically it's fairly shy um what what were some of the older sightings how far back did you find sightings in this in this particular area for well, the it, very specifically in that town, uh, I could only find sightings that went back a couple of years, so around 1970, where there was some sort of very vague uh, reports, you know, that had been some unknown creature called in to, to the police, and then, uh, like I said, the ladies that had experienced the thing at the picnic table uh, the year before. Um, but if you kind of to expand that out um you know for more miles around you could find reports that went back like 50 years um or so and that would that was more on towards iowa mm. where people had reported seeing you know hairy ape-like creatures and, and of course when you get back in those old reports they don't they don't call them bigfoot or anything i mean that that coin that term wasn't really coined until 1958 and that was on the west coast so most people in say 1920 20 or something i mean they're just not going they're just going to call it like a wild man or some ape or yeah. gorilla looking thing that's about the best they could describe it so you have those reports that are like that where people um had reported things that if we look at them now sort of under the scope of bigfoot you say wow that sounds like you know bigfoot or or momo you know specifically were there any native american legends about this thing in that area uh there wasn't there wasn't too much um in the way of that and i mean native americans certainly did l inhabit that region before the settlers moved in but uh, you know specifically there you know, I don't have anything. Uh, there was, you know, there's always, each tribe has, typically has some sort of a term or a word for forest people or hairy man or something. So um, it, it kind of exists, but nothing specifically in the, in the legends and lore of that, you know, specific area as far as the native um, 
but you know there was there's definitely some stuff in the 1800s like in the ozarks you got the legend of the blue man and mm, um, yeah. you know you see, once you get to kind of the 1800s you start to see the wild man reports and things like that now one of the things you talk about in the book is uh and this sounds awful to say cohomo um <laughs> Which was another uh, Bigfoot-like sighting that they gave its own name to that was similar to Momo. Right. <laughs> and that's another thing that you... Uh, uh, that Lauren Coleman put it the best in one of his books or something. He said that the rather unfortunately named Cahomo. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be named that today, you know? Right, be sensitive, and you know, not to disparage the people of, of that choice or at all, but just it just kind of was funny, it just because because of the fact that um, that you know now when Momo became famous, it, if there was something seen in a nearby town, which w- was the case here, and I believe that was over in Illinois, uh, you know, people they it's like Nessie, you know, you've got Nessie and Tahoe Tessie and. Mm-hmm. Bonessy, Chessy, yeah. and so now they they wanted to you know relate it somehow to Momo because that was what was popular in the news. So it's like it was on this uh, Co uh, Hollow Road, and it was seen you know there. So they called it Cohomo, <laughs> and that made newspapers. But that wasn't a very credible account and was quickly dismissed once you know some jokers kind of admitted to something and and oftentimes you do see that it's almost like the copycat effect you know if, one, mm-hmm. if all these monster sightings are being seen in one town all of a sudden you know some jokers in a nearby town will try to get something going there of which they've kind of manufactured themselves and it wasn't anything of you know um you know truthful origin but that that was Cahomo. And of course part of the culture and, and part of the story, obviously, which is why it's in the book, is because yeah. it's all part of that, you know, me, uh, you know, the mania going on in the media at the time and how Momo was just literally that well known. I mean, it was so well known that um, several years later, Six Flags over St. Louis had a ride and they called it. The, you know momo i mean people knew it so well that it was something they thought would attract you know people to the park by having a, a momo ride of yeah. which of which was this sort of an octopus thing that went around in a circle and looked and absolutely had nothing to do with a bigfoot <laughs> looking creature but they just threw the name on it yeah they just threw the name on it um the uh, there were also sightings of a white Bigfoot like creature with whiter hair, and I know that some of those pop up in like southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, the Albatwitch being one of them that's that's white haired and small. Um, but there were a few here later on, years later, right? Right. Yeah. And in yeah, those those white, you know, white Bigfoot like creatures. Those reports are kind of interspersed in. Um, with the others, I mean, they're a, a much lower percentage, but um, but in this case, I had actually corresponded with a guy who just inadvertently was talking about this subject and had a very good um, experience when he was younger with, uh, you know, what, what was some sort of a ape-like creature covered in white fur. And so I thought that was interesting. I mean, you know, just just because it was going on in that general area of Missouri and um, because there had been other, you know, white haired creatures like Lake Worth monster where I'm close to is sort of a well-known sort of Bigfoot like creature that's, that's covered in white hair. So, so yeah, those were, those were some of the cool sightings too, that I like to include. Now, one of the things about this is it, it's said to have three toes, right? Right. Ju- judging from the tracks that they found, which they attributed to the creature, um, in I, be- I guess I believe all of those cases, uh, it looked like it had three toes, and there was probably about four four different tracks found. One of those was kind of vaguely at the Harrison's home. There was another um, nearby. 
and then there was one found down by the Mississippi River, and then there was another one uh, found at a home which had actually been cast in plaster, but uh, without giving any spoilers away, I guess, that one turns out to be um, something quite surprising, but it did yeah. it did reinforce the notion that this thing had three toes, which played right into that whole notion that the thing could be from outer space because you know it that seemed uh, obviously more less you know less natural for for a ape like creature of earth origin you know you in, as opposed to some weird bizarre thing from another world that has three toes so that was right. that was pretty much what had been associated with momo although again the tracks that were found you know there's there's really no proof that they were from the from the creature or whatever it was that people had seen with their eyes yeah and i know there's at least one case where it was described as having red eyes but for the most part it wasn't correct right so, some of the artwork and the you know that's that exists um shows it as is having these you know glowing red eyes but in actuality the witnesses did not report such a thing really really actually couldn't see its eyes because of the the hair that hung over its face mm. um so you talk a little bit about the the mississippi river sightings and how the mississippi river is kind of a hotbed for these things and you think that's partially because of all the water available to them right yeah i think so i mean the there's always a correlation with these sightings, especially the more south you go in the U.S., with waterways. And, you know, it, it seems to make a lot of sense because not only is it, it water going to be a highly prized uh, item for something that it's that big and needs, you know, needs the uh, needs to drink water, but these waterways or the rivers, the creeks are typically in the most wooded areas uh you know riverways would be a place where they could travel sort of like a network or a highway of traveling from one place to another so if you start looking down that mississippi corridor and uh especially going south from there uh in some of the associated uh waterways like the couvre river at the very same time as momo's being seen you know, 20 miles to the north, you had sightings of of a similar creature wading across this Couvre River, which is right, basically a, right close to the Mississippi River. And, uh, you know, people had uh, seen, you know, something wading across. These guys thought it, at first they described it as they thought it was a hippie, I mean, a person with long hair. And, of course, this is 1972, so... That was part of the culture, and they said, but it as it came up out of the water, they realized the thing was covered in hair and looked like some kind of an ape, and they had been fishing down there, and they literally just threw their poles down and took off running and uh, reported this to the local ranger who was there at this at the particular park, and that uh, that to me was one of the you know, better sightings and, and as well, there were other ones along these waterways that kind of went south along the Mississippi River corridor and also showed me that, you know, it, it was always rumors of hoaxes and all this stuff. Oh, there's just some kids in the woods. I was like, well, they were awfully busy because, you know, <laughs> you're getting sightings up and down this you know this river corridor in roughly the same time period which would not be a problem for a you know an animal to move up and down a, a, a wide range but it, for kids to go all right let's go drive down there and make a siding and wait across the river it just doesn't sound plausible so yeah but if one person admits to, to faking it suddenly they all become fake Right, and and that's that's the thing I've I've noticed. It's I mean, it's almost like a, a you know a, a serial killer or something. There, you always get these people calling in and will confess to something, and it turns out they didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so you get this kind of effect where you know somebody wants to 
claim responsibility. Yeah, you know, that was us. And they may brag that to somebody at school. You know, they might call the news. I don't know. But uh, in all these cases, you always get that. And usually it, they'll say they did one thing, but they don't account for the whole of the phenomenon. It's like you must, you would have been really busy and you would have had to have a really, really good suit to fool people in broad daylight. Yeah. Uh, which kind of makes it hard to believe. And then, of course, you've got multiple people claiming they were the creatures. It's like, okay, one of you is lying. Which one? So, and even if they, even if you had one fake in- incident, does that really rule out that all the others aren't legit? Because, again, you got these kind of imitators, copycatters, and all kinds of stuff. So, it's really impossible to, to ultimately you know say it's any one thing including the hoax unless unless these people had come up with a suit or something and nobody ever comes up with a suit to go hey here's the actual suit never happens well well on that uh idea what do you think of the gimlin patterson film well you know i mean i i certainly hope that that is a a real creature but you know i'm not going to uh, I wouldn't jump to conclusions that are beyond what I can prove. I mean, I I think that in some ways, I see how people kind of see it as maybe that's a person in a suit just by, you know, casual looking at it. But upon closer examination, that film has held up over the years to scrutiny far beyond what Roger Patterson or Bob Gimlin could have ever predicted. And I think that there's a lot of credibility that that could be a real creature. And also, having gotten to know Bob Gimlin very well over the years, uh, I can, with most, you know, with all confidence, I can pr- say that if that's a hoax, then he, he wasn't even in on it because, you know, he would have had to been fooled too, which seems virtually impossible. Yeah, especially because he was carrying he was carrying a gun. So if you're going to try to hoax your partner over here, so <laughs> you know somebody could have gotten shot. And I think that you know, in my mind, while I mean, there's still just no way to prove it. I mean, there's just no yeah. you, know, you can debate all day, and and really that film was quite grainy, and no way to extract any more data out of it than it's already been pulled out of it. But um, so I, I I think that it. You know, the best I can say is I think it it could be a real creature, but you know, without any way to prove it, I can't I can't be wouldn't be right if I just said yeah. Right, right, right. Well, that's what I wanted. I wanted your thoughts on. It. I mean, because when I look at it, a few things occur to me. One, um, when we look at Planet of the Apes, that was done a few years later. You know, here's Hollywood's top effects, and they don't look anything as good as this this film does. Um, Two, it seems to be female, and I would think that if you're going to fake a Bigfoot sighting, especially back then, you're going to make it a male. It's just, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. It just seems like that's what you would do because you would think of him as a male. Um, and even when they, they, they've taken the, the footage and steadied it, it still holds up. It's not like you steady it and go, okay, now it looks fake. It still doesn't look fake to me. Right. And then, yeah, again, who could have ever predicted that? that you know i mean that we could examine it the way we can now and and yeah the thing about the female creature it would just seem like so much more trouble to craft the the breasts on it and everything else and you you would just think if you're gonna you would just kind of go the with the ubiquitous male bigfoot if you're gonna try to make footage it doesn't make any sense just to why to make it female and i mean there's other things too almost like this whole suit thing that people claim that the costume maker philip morris who had a big costume company and he came out in the last oh 10 years or so saying well that's roger patterson got that suit from me that's my suit you know Mm -hmm. i created bigfoot and all this nonsense first off he was selling gorilla costumes back in the late in the 60s that look nothing like that they were like right. black and they had i mean those old cheesy big uh, gorilla costumes that you see in on halloween or in the movies 
those don't look like that creature. So I'm like, okay, whatever. And then he went on this, he went around promoting himself as, you know, trying to say he had created Bigfoot and all that. And I think it was obviously for publicity. And then National Geographic was going to do a show where they were going to recreate that suit and they were going to even have Bob Hieronymus, which is said to have, you know, worn the suit or claims to have worn the suit. He's going to wear it. So when they did this, using the budget from National Geographic and all of Philip Morris's, you know, collective know-how of building costumes that he had, you know, over the years, they made this costume and it looks totally fake. I mean, it's <laughs> like, dude, you know, if you can't, it, it's just ridiculous. And so when actually when that, that segment aired right when they were going to reveal the, you know, the here it is proof we made this Bigfoot costume. It looks so dumb that they just show the Patterson Gimlin film again. It's like, really? Wow. And, and of course, I've got photos of that costume and you can see, especially in the legs, it's like you can see it's like material and it's like, dude, it's ridiculous. So, you know, the, the again, you just have people claiming that claiming responsibility that have no way to back it up. Yeah, yeah, and it gives them them a way to make some money for a little bit on it. But is is there any amount of evidence that would completely, I mean, short of finding a body, is any amount of video, photographs, tracks, anything like that ever going to prove that these things exist? I don't think it will. I mean, especially now, as far as the video, yeah. you know, there's just too too much technology out there to create CGI and and so forth. Is nobody could ever be a hundred percent sure that wasn't some way you know created with trickery or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that's going to. You know, even if the thing is not shaky or blurry, it's still not going to prove. You know, bear the burden of proof to to mainstream science. Now, the best thing we have is some footprints, which are you know convincing, just in their shape and size and construction anatomy, as well as some of them that have what could be considered dermal ridges, which are like you know foot uh, fingerprints. Basically, mm -hmm. there's a you know a, a, a lot of good examples of that. But th that in, unto itself isn't going to prove, you know, sway Main Street science. The best that can do is say, hey, you know, there may be something to this phenomenon. So these are things that support, uh, you know, the fact that it's it's good to keep looking into it. It, it provides, you know, positive movement in, in that direction. But it, it's, you know, hair samples that can't be identified that look ape-like and there's nothing to compare them to those are you know intriguing as well but again just unless there's some dna that be, could be gleaned from these sources there's no way to prove anything so i think it at this point it's just literally going to take a body nothing short of a body to to make everybody believe that bigfoot's not a you know a board game or a commercial you know venture it's actually a real creature yeah um you also talk about the ice men and there's there's a uh, you actually got now did, were you able to see the real ice men the, or i should say the fake real ice man yes i've actually seen that mm -hmm. and what, what are your thoughts on that whole thing well you know the the reason well the reason that was in the book is because i had in, inadvertently run into a woman who I first began talking about the Falk monster with who just happened to say that I she saw this really strange creature creature she believed it was a creature uh, in Missouri back in the 60s and she tells me this story about how she saw it and stuff and it, it's a really cool story and the woman's very very smart and very credible and you know I, I naturally thought oh okay frozen you know, caveman or Bigfoot body. Well, you saw the Minnesota Iceman, but then I looked into it and realized the time frame, the time frame didn't match up. She couldn't have seen the Minnesota Iceman. So this was something completely different, which ties into that town of Louisiana. But um, the weird thing is, is, I've seen that you know the gaff or the the Minnesota Iceman because 
I participated in a Shipping Wars episode in which uh, my friend Steve Boosty from the Museum of the Weird in Austin purchased that thing and had it transported from Minnesota down here to Texas. So in, in doing that, we they stopped off in Falk, Arkansas to do a Bigfoot hunt with Lyle Blackburn. It was kind of you know something they incorporated into the show. But when we did the episode, I was able to see that that very thing. I mean, this was literally the thing that had been shown as the Minnesota Iceman. Um, and of course, if it's a long story, but basically yeah. this was supposedly a replacement for the real body. Um, and the real body had to be gotten rid of because the FBI found out that it was crossing state lines as, as Frank Hansen was showing it at various state fairs and carnivals which is illegal if that's actually a real dead body. So supposedly he, he had it replaced with a, you know, a lookalike out of you know, latex. Um, whether there's a, was an original body, I, I don't know. It, the stories and the whole thing seem very much like carnival conjuration. I mean, yeah. He kept changing the origin story, and it, it and all these things are always owned by some unseen millionaire behind the scenes and <laughs> stuff like that. So that, to me, you know, just the circumstances or the circumstantial things that are supposed to support this just don't look good. Yeah, uh, the only thing that's got in his favor it was to, a couple of cryptos wall just examined it. Um. And believed, even though they, you know, it was in the ice, they still believed it was a, at one time, a live creature. And so they're the closest that's ever been able to examine it. And if, if they believe that, I mean, I don't know. They were there. I wasn't. So who knows? Okay. Um, so let, let, jump back, jumping back into your book a little more. Uh, one of the things you uh, talk about on there are uh, some of the anomalous lights that people have encountered um and again you don't seem to you're, you're you mentioned ufos a few times but none of these lights seem like they're ufos like there's one that um came up on someone while he was uh out hunting and or they come across this and they seem more like will-o'-wisps earth lights things like that but they like those things they seem to have some level of consciousness to them right yeah i i, I did a comparison over some of the strange lights to some phenomenon uh, that actually takes place here in Texas along Bragg Road. Um, they're sort of a spook light thing, and that's certainly more light than, you know, UFO craft. Um, so, you know, the point there being that there are cases where strange spook lights have been seen in proximity to sightings of you know, upright, hairy bipeds. And, uh, you know, again, it's like, are the things connected or is it just uh, perhaps a, po a paranormal pocket where all sorts of weird stuff happens, almost like John Keel would probably suggest, where these, you know, areas like Point Pleasant uh, just, you know, invite these all sorts of strange phenomenon. But uh, basically... Um, the lights, you know, like I said, that were seen in Louisiana, Missouri around the Momo time were, you know, people see a green and a yellow light or, or, you know, a bluish light or whatever. And they definitely seemed a little more unexplainable spook light than they did, uh, you know, silvery craft that landed. So, uh, and, the, and, the, weird. And, the, and these lights are almost always primary colors too. I always found that interesting. Right, that's true. Yeah, I mean, they're not, they're never rainbow with multicolor. It's usually something very simple. And, yeah, I, you know, that's, there's always, in any of these, it's just a mind bending uh, thought process to try to make sense of it because they're just, it's just stuff that I have no doubt that people saw the stuff. But it's like, what, what really, you know, really, what was it? That's that's what we keep trying to answer. But um, at, at least as far as you know, what was being seen, I, I have no doubt people saw these lights. 
the uh, one of the things I, I've taken to doing with any kind of paranormal phenomena is I, I look at it under the lens of a poltergeist. And when you take out the creature sightings from here, you have bad smells, you have vocalizations, uh, growling. Um, I didn't recall anything being thrown, but you have all characteristics of a poltergeist. And then you have the monster. Like I, I've pointed out a lot of times that like when people go on Bigfoot hunts, they don't see Bigfoot, but they get rocks thrown at them. They hear vocalizations. They hear knocking, which are all poltergeist things. And I almost wonder how much of an interaction we're having with the land or the area that we're in, if some of these areas draw something from us that create these phenomena or give these phenomena the ability to exist. Um, and like the, the smell, uh, Joshua Cutchin had written a, a book on paranormal smells. And sulfur is the most common paranormal smell, which I guess shouldn't be that surprising. And you described this thing, uh, people described it as, as sulfurous at times, right? Right, yep. And I almost wonder if, uh, like Keel talks about them manifesting in this world only for a short time or whatever, um, I wonder if it's the smell of them deteriorating. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very interesting and all of that, the that particular smell that sort of has the same description of sulfur in, in um, different places, the, the how you can connect this certain stuff to poltergeist activity. almost hadn't thought of it that in terms of like a, a ghostly activity connected to this uh, as far as the, you know, what's what types of things are going on. But yeah, it's just, it's weird. And uh, just again, another level of this puzzle to try mm -hmm. to explain paranormal, you know, and all the weird stuff that goes on within it. Well, I, I take poltergeist activity as generally coming from us rather than ghosts. You know, I mean, like if you talk to a parapsychologist, they'll say it's usually, you know, certain types of people generate this type of PK energy, which that at least we have some evidence of in labs and stuff scientifically. Um, it doesn't explain why we'd, we'd have a monster. But the other thing is there's a, I had talked to, oh, let me see, let me grab his name. I can never remember. Uh, Eric Ouellette, or Ouellette, and he wrote a book on UFOs as a, as a poltergeist-like apparition. And one of the things I also look for in this stuff is like, this stuff all comes in waves, just like poltergeists do. Like poltergeists slowly, you know, you'll get an, uh, an episode here, an episode here, and then they build up to a certain point, and then they just kind of peter out. And in that petering out, you also get a lot of tricksters moving in, like people faking stuff and trying to keep it going and things like that. And I feel like when I was reading this, I was seeing that too. Like there's a there's a crescendo of the the sightings, and then they kind of peter out, and then you start to see some of the fakes and stuff moving into it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is an interesting um, observation on this, and certainly something that now I'm going to think about in terms of <laughs> when I look at these cases. There's another way to to think about it because yeah, that's absolutely the pattern almost of, of what's going on. Um, you also talked about bells. Were people hearing bells too in some of these cases or were those different cases? Uh, there was an incident a few days after the Harrison kids had seen the creature. Um, the uh, Harrisons were having a prayer meeting at their house. There's like dozens of people over there. And after that meeting, they were kind of hanging around outside and they heard this, what started is sort of a clanging, clanging noise, like a metallic noise, uh, got louder and louder, and then it became like a, a growling noise. And so, mm -hmm. you know, while it wasn't a, a bell, it almost, I mean, there was a water tower on top of Mars off Hill, so I don't know if that was the source, but they said it got louder and louder. I mean, it was a very loud, it was so loud and weird, and then when the, the the growling came in, it was so loud that Miss Harrison just ran out of the house with all the kids and told her husband, Edgar, to get in the car. Get We're getting out of here. This is enough. And they, you know, okay, fine. So we got in the car, and they took off. And then as they were driving down, they live on a dead-end street. And as they were driving, you know, down they to get out of there, they saw about 40 people coming up the hill with almost like, clubs and guns and pitchforks or what have you and they they had heard this noise 
And Miss Harrison just leaned out the window and said something like, they're coming, get out of here. And everybody just took off running. So, I mean, literally a scene out of a movie, but that was all based on this, this sound that had been heard um, following, you know, monster sightings. Ah, okay. For some reason, I had written down bell. I had written down lights, bells, and voices, but that might have been something slightly different. And maybe that's what I was thinking of. And once again, I want to thank all of our patrons, but particularly those at the ten dollars or more level: Allison Cook, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Nick Martin, UFO Weekly News Super Inframan, Eric Hervin, Tim, Edu Camahort, Janet Bunderson. 36 Dingo, Maria, Nate Syria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, Paul Buscini, Kevin, John L- Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Lorg, Matthias Sunby, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Demian Tallman, Chris, Is a Hot Dog a Sandwich, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You help make this show possible. One of the uh, things you talk about that could explain how a real, like, flesh and blood creature could hide in this type of area are the cave systems there. Right. That was definitely one thing to look at because, you know, you got to kind of consider if. If it's a real creature, if it's a Bigfoot-like creature, or if there's a history of these, you know, where are, you know, where are they seeking refuge? How, where are they, you know, finding seclusion? And up in that area, you do have a lot of caves. There's a lot of cave systems, and um, some are much larger and bigger than others. You know, sort of, you know, uh, tourist attractions now. You can go, you know, walk through these caves. But there's also just a lot of small ones and, and some that are probably that are not really mapped or documented so it was one thing to consider that well that it could offer a place to hide because the way the land is up there if anybody's familiar with sort of that rural area of of illinois and missouri you do have a lot of wooded areas you have a lot, a lot of these rolling hills and you have cave systems but you also have a lot of farm you know uh farm and pasture areas and crops where it there's big open gaps you know so there's got to be some place for you know a creature to sort of hole up as opposed to like living in the pacific northwest or even south in the ozarks or the washita mountains where there's these much bigger chunks of forestry i mean in fact there's not a, not a lot of bears live or pass through louisiana the town um, just because it's not the best habitat, but if you go down in the Ozarks and things, you're going to, you're going to come across plenty of bear. Um, it's just certain habitats are better suited for big, large, hairy, uh, animals. So the caves are something I looked into and there, it was weird because you always find these weird things like the lady with the story about the thing in the ice that she saw in Missouri. There was another story by, uh, buddy jerry hestand who is a, a big researcher from texas had been up and talked to somebody who described this cave that people were calling monkey cave and i thought wow that's kind of weird you know you got bigfoot like creature sightings and then people calling this thing monkey cave and supposedly there was a monkey skull found in it but mm. you know i try then i try to run these stories down and i can only get so far but determine that there was a cave and there was some kind of skull but it's long gone and you know no no way to evaluate it or anything but it's kind of cool just the weird connections um one of the uh native american things you talk about in there and i don't think it was quite from this area but you were talking about the connection between ufos and and these creatures uh you were talking about a native american legend of these things being beasts from a small moon right when i when I was researching this, um, seeing as how like MUFON investigators were kind of saying that Momo could be, you know, an extraterrestrial, and, and the lights were crafts that were bringing him to the Earth, I thought, 
I wonder how many sightings or how many reports or stories there are where anyone ever actually said they saw one of these type creatures get off of a craft because mm-hmm. typically it's like you see there's the lights somebody sees the thing but nobody ever sees them getting off but i did find an old story it's a second i mean this is well it's a third hand story considering it was second hand to uh brad steiger who is an, another author but he had you know supposedly corresponded with a guy who had uh knowledge of a story where the native americans had this creature that they were feeding and and keeping alive in a cave and supposedly it had come from some sort of a ball of light or something that had come from the sky and like getting off of a moon or whatever they they described it as i can't remember exactly offhand but what you're describing um that was pretty close to like okay well that sounds like at least second or third hand somebody saw this thing come to earth and get out of the craft Mm -hmm. um but beyond that there was you know i looked and i looked and i talked to nick redfern and all my buddies who are knowledgeable on that type of phenomenon and you just really couldn't find a lot of well really any uh you know cases where people were saying you know that they saw him get off the craft so yeah the, the best thing again the best the thing that you can ever speculate is that it could be connected, but there's no there's no way to say for sure. And that's assuming that the lights they're seeing are extraterrestrial rather than you know Earth created in some way. Right. Yeah. I mean that that's a whole other thing. I would not to say that they're even extraterrestrial in the first place. So, um, because when I see things like that together, I think that that it's 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 an energy area, you know, and and it's creating this stuff somehow and we're just seeing different pieces of it i mean maybe these things are even tulpa like in a way right um go ahead yeah i mean there's there's so many ways to see it which is why i never really you know I, i don't i don't criticize anybody for the way that they may try to envision as to how this all works because i mean there's just so many ways to look at it and uh, keeping an open mind i mean nobody can prove nobody can prove anyone is right so you just kind of have to everybody entertains whatever you know perspective they have on it which is always an is interesting to think about it in different ways yeah yeah and i and i like the fact that you went through some of those different ideas in the book from hoaxes to some of the the alien theories and so on and so on and so forth in there um, because I think that's what need what's needed is we need to look at these things in different ways. I remember years ago I had asked you why we haven't found a body yet, and I think you said that was like the, the hardest thing about all this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you kind of got to call it like it is too. You know, any if if somebody if I write a book about the case and some and there's a rumor of the hoax, well, I just run it down as best I can and include that. If people, you know, I just say people connected to ufos and then kind of just talk about you know is that or is that not and and put everything in there because it's all part of the story whether it proves or disproves or adds a another confusing level and then certainly with bigfoot you know that's not having a body is is a problem and the longer it goes it's more of a problem because you know we're kind of closing in on on the potential habitat for that our technology is getting better so the longer it goes and we still don't have a body it is why i think that more radical theories have been proposed about bigfoot um to try to explain how it is that you know normal everyday people are are clearly seeing something weird that we can't explain but how in the world that we don't have an actual body so that's that's the uh the whole crux of the matter is that without that body it's just endless theories yeah and i and i and that's the thing with all this stuff is that that we have endless theories but without any solid evidence it's very hard to pin anything that's one of the things i like about some of the the psi research done in labs is that's actually solid scientific stuff but it's it's the it's the exception in a lot of this stuff yes it's it's hard to just make it appear you know, you can't summon, well, I guess some people will say you can summon UFOs, but um, 
for the most part, this stuff is is you know by chance. Um, you uh, you did the go ahead. I thought yeah, you were going to say something. No, um, no. you did uh the voice, the the narration for uh the Boggy Creek Monster. Right. Yeah, I've I've narrated a number of the small town monsters movies at this okay. point. That's what I thought. And uh, w- there's uh, is Momo small town monsters too. Yeah, that'll be the newest film, which comes out uh, here in uh, September. So that's the latest. Which now, like Boggy Creek Monster, I was the first my involvement in small town monsters documentaries. That's Seth Breedlove and his company. Um, obviously, I mean, I'm the guy who wrote the book, the researcher. So I'm in that to a certain degree and i narrate it from a first person point of view and everybody seemed to like my narration so then we mm-hmm. did the mothman of point pleasant and i i co-wrote narrated and and helped produce that one and then i did uh beast of bray road and terror in the sky um where you just literally it's just my voice as the narrator but in momo uh we did something much more interesting where we, we have a concept of that there's this old grindhouse movie that was made about you know the momo case of the 70s and so at the same time we use that we show that which shows the reenactments then i come in as me on screen as if i have a (laughs) a television show called blackburn's cryptid case files Mm -hmm. and i sort of you know dissect the film and and tell what is true and what is not true and present the viewers with you know the true story of momo so it's a kind of a mind trip but but cool because in this case i'm on screen all all my narration is literally done on screen instead of you know aloof okay yeah i I saw you post something about it i wasn't sure what it meant (laughs) yeah yeah it's it's one of those where it's much different than what people are used to if they've watched the other, you know, let's see, eight other, eight, eight other small town monsters movies. Momo is quite a departure, but so far I've seen the reviews. Every single one of them just is awesome and and praises the innovation. And you know, you got to mix things up and make it cool. So this is one where you, it's harder to explain it than just to like people just see it and then especially if they've read my book and then they see the movie, then that that's going to make even more sense because you kind of know the full story about the whole case. And then now you're seeing this crazy grindhouse movie version of it <laughs> w- with reenactments. It's just nuts. Huh. Okay. Um, what do you, what do you plan on working on next? Uh, well, lately I've been back to, writing a new album for my band ghoul town which i do every couple of years or so um is to almost when inspiration hits really you can't just conjure these things but uh so i've been er, momo came out um you know several months ago and then you know beyond that i started working on the ghoul town stuff filmed the momo uh thing with seth and then uh, of course, I'm always kind of got a book in the back of my mind, which I've sort of roughly got started. So, so those are the things I'm working on. It's, I think nowadays it's pretty much a juggle between writing a book, doing the films, and doing music. So I'm just sort of, it's three balls in the air right there. <laughs> but you are enjoying it, I assume. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's every day I wake up. The hardest part about all of it is like, well, what am I going to work on today? What one of these cool things? Uh, um, <laughs> You know, and and you not I got to work hard. You know, you can't you you got to put a lot of time and effort into these things to make them, you know, good and quality. But it's all very fun and and interesting. And so I never never complain about my well, if you call it a job, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any appearances or anything coming up? I do. Uh, you know, what's the uh, once the uh, fall season hits, there's quite a few. So that I'll be at Horror Hound, uh, the Horror Hound Horror Convention in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, here on September 6th through 8th. And then there's a 
uh, the Arkansas Bigfoot Conference on September 21st, and then I'll be over in Alabama October 4th and 5th at the Alabama Bigfoot Conference, which I think is the first year for that, so that'll be interesting. And then I always do the Texas Bigfoot Conference um, October 18th and 19th this year in Texas, and then after that I've got some Ghoul Town tour dates, so it's going to be a busy September, October. And any chance Ghoul Town's hitting the East Coast at all? Unfortunately not. Um, that's that's always the problem. It's just to, to get that done. It takes so much time and effort. And um, so the extensive tours are just have been non-existent ever since I you know, was doing this other stuff. Yeah, that's what I figured, but I can always hope. <laughs> well, I'd love to do a big tour. I mean, I kind of have plans for that after this next album comes out. But, you know, the reality of that is is it, it, it's hard to keep up you know with the movie schedule and stuff and then to try to realize i need to take a month or two to two or so yeah um did you, you I, I take it you don't want to mention what your next book might be well i've i've you know i've mentioned i guess so far but it, it, i don't it's not on it's a little different because it's not about a case like a lot of my books like lizard man or beast of boggy creek or momo it's kind of about a specific famous case in this case it focuses more on certain geographic locations and mm-hmm. all the phenomenon that may exist within it and so this is going whereas momo kind of got me off into some ufo and weird stuff this takes me in even weirder directions because um these type locations all throughout America have multiple phenomenons associated with them, all kind of creepy stuff. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's fun and in a way to, I've kind of wanted to expand, um, you know, the agenda. I mean, I like writing Bigfoot books and stuff, but, um, you know, I don't want to keep, you know, I don't, unless it's just something that really strikes me, I want to, I want to kind of keep things fresh. So I'll, uh, as I get further with this book, I'll be able to be more specific about what it is because it's, a, I think, a great idea, and I think people are going to love it. I just uh, need to make sure I'm, you know, get a hold of it before I say too much. <laughs> no, I think it's a fantastic idea because that's that's just it. You see this phenomenon, so, like obviously Skinwalker Ranch is the most famous one, but there there are spots all over the world where numerous phenomena just kind of call home, and uh, there's no good explanation why yet. And it may hold the key to understanding this stuff a lot better if we can figure out why some why some spots are more active than others. Right, and and those are, you know, and and, and you can rest assured that I that what I'm going to write about is the creepiest of places and things like that because I love the creepy element of it. I just like when I said I was a kid and I uh, was attracted to this the creepy element of it. That's mm-hmm. that's kind of a theme here, and uh, so it's uh, I think a a good idea that people will will like oh i know i definitely like the idea so uh, <laughs> i assume that'll be that'll be a ways down the line though huh yeah yeah people always say uh, when, when can we expect it that's those are that's the hard that's the hardest thing for me to answer because i literally have no idea because you know it, it takes so long to research these things and then i do get sidetracked and i'll have to go in the studio for probably two months at least to record the album once we get it worked up so i would say ne- i mean it'll come out next next year at best right right uh okay so let's talk gold town for a moment you put out an album what was it two years ago Ghost to the southern sun yeah i think it's been yeah a little over two years now and it, it was a while before from the prior one wasn't it because you pretty much stopped yeah it had, did have been a good while we did uh <laughs> Oh, see the the Elvira Mistress of the Dark thing we did with Elvira was in I think 2010, mm. so that was whatever seven yeah it was roughly like seven years there was no no album and we we played during that time but we just kind of took off and that's when I was really you know I'd written the book and all this other stuff happened and I was on TV shows and stuff and. Um, I saw that as a benefit could expose the band to a bigger audience. Mm-hmm. So it was still in a way it, the band was had recorded a lot of stuff and had albums, but 
hadn't really reached its potential in my opinion so over those years it just kept getting bigger and bigger and uh then finally we're like you know we, we i got the i had the songs well we got to record this album so we that mm-hmm. that was ghost of the southern sun and then that received that was well received and so i'm like you know let's i'm going to try to be more <laughs> timely about this so our new album <laughs> the new album is will come out next spring and uh it, I, I think it's one of the best things we've done it's it's really I, I really like the songs that have been written so it's a lot of fun and uh where can people get the ghoul town stuff is it all available online uh yeah you can get it pretty much anywhere i mean itunes and amazon and Bandcamp, and it you know you can add it to your playlist on spotify and amazon music i mean it's on literally everything in whatever format you like and then if people want cds or vinyl you know vinyl lps and so forth you could go to ghoultown.com g-h-o-u-l-t-o-w-n ghoultown.com and uh get a hard copy cd i think you can i mean you can also get them on amazon and stuff but um but always better to buy them direct from from us so oh yeah yeah Okay. Um, and where can people follow you as far as like the, the paranormal stuff? What's the best place? Uh, just hit up my website at lyleblackburn.com, L-Y-L-E blackburn.com. And uh, there's links there to everything. So, you know, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and everything else. And you can find the links and you can, you can go there and look at the list of my books. And my books are available also from my online store there. Uh, directly from me if you want some awesome autographed versions and i sell t-shirts that are like my book covers and uh but of course you know you can get my stuff on all the books on amazon and if you would like to see our small town monsters movies those are a lot of those stream they're on amazon streaming Uh, a lot of those are on prime so if you've got prime you can just literally you know call it up and watch it so just search lyle blackburn on amazon and you'll see the various choices there for your reading and viewing pleasure. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us, Lyle. Absolutely. I always enjoy it. You have been listening to where did the road go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. 